good each and every one of you out this morning. Uh, you all know us, this morning kicks off our revival that runs through Wings tonight. Yeah. Through Wings tonight. <laughs> I had to verify that before I completely throw that out there. Uh, you know, it's a good time to let God revive your hearts. Let God revive your minds. Now, that's what I put on the screen this morning. Let God revive you this morning. You know, that's, that's what it's all about. Being on fire for God. You know, let Him fill you with your spirit. So our first song, you know, I thought, how can you not kick off the revival and revive us again?
a bad thought or just something bad, or if it's something good, you can always lay on the arms of Jesus because he's always there.
know that God speaks to me about with this song. So as you sing this song this morning, let God speak to you through it. Because He can speak to us through music. As we worship Him, let Him reach out and touch you with the lyrics of these songs. In Christ alone.
our prayer time, we'll go ahead and read the prayer requests that have been written down. And you can let me know if you have any other prayer requests or praises uh, this morning. We have prayer requests for Kenny Russell, Justin Russell, the family of Earl Swafford, my co worker I've been asking prayer for for a couple of months. He passed away over the weekend. Uh, Jesse Davis, cancer. Cindy Russell, uh, her grandmother passed away. Amy Hampton is very ill. Jason Williams is recovering from heart surgery. And Bridget Ferguson. Do we have any other prayer requests or praises this morning? Frida? For Charlie Dever. Charlie Dever. Liz is going to have surgery Thursday. Heavenly Father, as you are so good, you're wonderful, you're kind, you're generous, you're loving. God, we just thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you have put our way, Father. God, we thank you, Lord, for this congregation. God, for those in attendance this morning, Father. God, for those watching online. God, I'm just thankful, Father, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord, for people to experience your word. Father, God, I just ask, Lord, that you would be encouraged this morning, God, that you would speak through him for him from this morning uh, to tonight and through Wednesday night, Father, God, that you would uplift him. God, you get him words to say, Father, Lord, that would uh, touch each and every one of our hearts, Father. God, for those who are lost, for those who are uh, just passing through, God, for those who uh, didn't even know they might be coming this week, God, the Lord would pray for each and every one of them. Lord, that they would count upon your word, Father, God, that they would uh, see, Lord, that they do need you, Father. God, just ask, Lord, for each and every prayer request, Lord, to mention, Lord, it should be Kenny Russell, Justin Russell. For the family of Earl Swafford, Lord, for Fran and, and, uh, and Mickey. God, that you would uh, uplift them, Father. And God, that you would be a judge and David's and cancer. For Cindy Russell, Lord, and lost her grandmother. She'd be a third family. For Amy Hampton, Lord God, she is very ill. Lord, uplift her and her family, Father. And God, for Jason Williams. Lord, is uh, recovering from heart surgery, Lord, but more than that, recovering from drug addiction. Lord, I pray, God, that this would be a uh, wake-up call for him, Father. God, for Brittany, Lord, if you would uh, strike in her heart, God, she'd know we're hurting you more, Father. God, she'd be a Charlie Dever. For Liz Coffey, Lord, she had surgery this weekend. For Earl Gregory, Jr., for Kathy, this is okay, and for Liz Coffey, this is okay. For Michelle Tuller, Lord, she has a broken arm. For Casey's friend, and God, for Tina Davis, Lord, that you would uplift them all, God, that you would comfort them, that you would heal them. God, that ultimately, Lord, that you would draw them all closer to you, Father. God, that you would uh, bring them closer to you. God, that you would grant them, Lord, the knowledge and the wisdom, the 
Lord, to understand what you have given us. Lord, I just continue, Lord, just ask that you would gently live and just uplift the new Father. God, in Jesus' name, I do pray. we go to the lake where we spent most of our academic career. <laughs> and uh, next thing I know, my right leg goes completely underneath the water. My left leg is straight out. My pants are ripped from the front to the back. <laughs> and there was Kurt laughing at me. <laughs> he didn't pull me to safety. He didn't build a fire to get me warm. He was laughing at me. So I thought, I think I'll bring him here to speak to us this morning. <laughs> so you all remember him from last time, and uh, several people wanted, to, to, uh, wanted me to invite him back, and so I hesitantly did. <laughs> and, uh, no, I'm just kidding. So, Kurt, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, pray a blessing upon, uh, upon you as, uh, as we get started. Father, thank you for uh, one of my greatest friends ever. Father, thank you for the, the brotherhood that I have with them. But through Christ, thank you for uh, uh, the life you've given us to call us to preach your word. And, uh, Father, I just pray a blessing upon Kurt and the servant, upon those who will hear and listen. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. I am so glad to be back with you guys. Um, I was, I've been looking forward to coming back to Artemis um, since I found out I was invited back. Um, that, I, I, I love preaching revivals. I like to preach anyway. I just love preaching. But I like preaching revivals. And I love going to I love going to, to, to just give God's word uh, uh, to people. And I, I, I'm not just saying this. I promise you, um, this has been last year was one of my favorite revivals uh, that I've ever held, and it was because of you guys. I, I felt very I felt very connected with the, with the, the, the family here at uh, at Artemis, and uh, so I've been looking real forward to coming uh, since I was invited again. And, and our plans were for. My wife and, and children to come with me this time. Um, life was the only thing that was missing last time. It's missing this time too. Uh, we couldn't couldn't make that happen. My son has autism, and uh, he's very regimented. Everything is very structured. And they just started school about two weeks ago. And to pull him out of school for a week, it would completely derail everything we've been trying to accomplish with him. So uh, they send their love to to their their unknown church family in Artemis. They haven't mentioned, but they're still your church family. Because we are all a part of God's body, amen? Isn't it a wonderful thing to be a part of God's body? Um, we, uh, as, as we come together tonight, uh, this morning, tonight, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, uh, we're going we're gonna to be looking at, at what it means to be who we are as Christians and, and how God wants us to live that life out. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, what does it mean to be called? What does it mean to be called? Now, before I get into that, I want to let you know, I do love preaching. Uh, I, I just I love to give God's word. I love preaching. I've been preaching. I've been in ministry for over 18 years now. And something odd happened uh, not too long ago. Uh, I was uh, I was helping my wife uh, uh, change the sheets on the bed, and uh, well, that, that's unusual because usually I uh, I don't help her do stuff like that. But I was helping change the sheets, and I noticed underneath her side of the bed was a basket, and in that basket was five eggs. And six hundred dollars, and and I thought to myself, well, that's a little unusual. I mean, we got chickens, and usually we we, we sell the eggs to pay for the chicken food. It doesn't really bother me, you know. There's, there's money laying there. I was just kind of curious about it, so 
I said, honey, you know, what, what is this basket? What's, what's going on with this basket? She said, well, uh, she said, it's just something I do. And she was a little hesitant about it, but she finally told me, she said, well, for every bad sermon you preach, I put, a, I put an egg in that basket. I said, you put an egg in the basket every time I preach? And I was a little offended at first, but then I got to thinking, I've been preaching now almost 18 years. She's only heard five bad sermons. That ain't bad, right? I feel pretty good. I was like, okay, all right, bad sermon. Gets, a, gets, a, gets an egg. I said, what's the money for? She said, every time I get a dozen, I sell them. <laughs> God uses everybody in whatever way that he can, can get them. God doesn't want your abilities. God wants your availability. I want you to understand that. God doesn't want your abilities. God wants your availability. If you will make yourself available to Him, He'll use whatever tool is given Him. Uh, when I, I talk about tools, I think about my dad. My, my father passed away a couple years ago. And I remember, uh, you know, when you go through things like that, you, you think of, uh, you think of uh, past memories. And I, I, I always had, maybe you all know what I'm t- talking about. My dad in his garage had a red toolbox. Maybe you know what kind of toolbox I'm talking about. It's got wheels on the bottom of it, a big old tall thing. It's got drawers in it, right? Well, my dad's toolbox, that was a kind of a prized possession of my dad. Everything he needed, he kept in those toolboxes. Well, when he passed away, I, I moved my mother out to where we live in, uh, in, in North Carolina from Kentucky here. And, and so uh, when I came and got her, I, I noticed that, that, that toolbox. And so that toolbox is covered with me. So I got the toolbox, and I got to thinking about that thing. You know, I can't find anything in that toolbox. I'll be honest with you. I don't know where everything is in that toolbox. There's so much stuff crammed into the. I don't even know how the doors close on, on some of those things because there's so many tools in there. And some of them, I don't have any clue what kind of tool they are. I think Noah used them when he built the ark. I'm not sure. They are old, and, and some of them are rusty, and, and some of them still have grease stains on them, and some of them are dinged up. and They're just not very pretty. But when I think about my dad's toolbox, I think this. If you ask my dad, uh, Richard, can you get me a left-handed flume a dozen? If there is such a critter, my dad would know what that thing is, and he would know exactly where it was in that toolbox. He wouldn't have to open up all the drawers and look. He would know exactly which one it was. He'd open it, he'd reach in there, and he'd get it for you. When I think about that toolbox, I think about our Heavenly Father. Because he works the same way. The tool belongs to the Master, right? And the Master knows how to use the tools. He also knows where the tool is and, and for what job it needs to be used for. And I envision, I'm a, I'm a visual kind of guy, I envision our Heavenly Father with this great big old red toolbox. And inside that toolbox, there's these drawers, and inside those drawers are all these beat up, banged up, rusty old tools. Some of them have been hurt, some of them aren't very pretty at all. Some of them just, they, they look beat up and worn out. But the Master knows for which job the tool is needed, correct? Yeah. And He knows how to use that tool. We are tools in the Master's toolbox. Yeah. And if we will make ourselves available, He will use us as He needs us to be used. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, I love you. And I thank you so much for allowing us to be here. God, I, I, I love your word. I love your church. And God, as we get into your word, I pray that we would be built up, that we would be encouraged. Father, if need be, we would be rebuked and corrected by your word. Father, your word is living and breathing and active. It's not just a bunch of letters organized on paper. But Father, it is your love letter to us. Lord, as we open your love letter, as we look at that, I pray that we would understand what you have for us today. Father, remove me from the equation so that your truth would ring through. Father, I love you. I just pray that everything today would give you glory, honor, praise. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I love the church. I love the church. I absolutely passionately love the church. Uh, I love uh, I love being at the congregation that I serve at, but I also love being here, and I love being with other believers because I love the church. And as we talk, uh, one of the one of the things that comes up from time to time, especially when I'm speaking to other people in other congregations, is is I hear uh, this thing about being called, and they ask, "Now, were you called into ministry, or, or does God really call people into ministry? Does God call us to do different things?" And so we're going to look at that today. What does it mean to be called? What does it mean to be called? John chapter 1. If you want to turn your Bibles to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verses 35 through 45. 
John chapter 1, verses 35 through 45 is where, is where we're going to start. And, and I'm going to kind of roll through a bunch of different places, but that's where that's the biggest chunk comes from John 1. So in John chapter 1, 35 to 45, here's what it says. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Well, I'm going to stop right there, which is kind of funny. And Jake, you probably appreciate this. I can just see how this looks. John the Baptist is sitting here with his guys. And they've been following him. And they're sold out to John because they're a part of his ministry. And they're doing whatever they need to be doing. And they love John. They passionately want to follow John. And here's John sitting with his guys. And John looks up and here comes Jesus. He says, hey guys, look, there's Jesus. And the two guys look at each other, and they look at John the Baptist, and they look at Jesus, and they look back at each other, and they pick up, and they take off after Jesus. They just completely left John. I thought that was funny. But on verse 38, he keeps going on. He says, turn around. Jesus saw him following, and he said, what do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went, and they saw where he was staying. They spent the day with him. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said, who had followed Jesus. And the first thing John did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, hey, we found the Messiah, that is Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Verse 44 says, Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida, Philip found Nathanael, told him, We found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and the one whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, the son of Joseph. This is the calling of the first disciples. And as you look at the calling of the first disciples, whether you read it in John, or whether you read it in Matthew, or Mark, what you will see in there is when Jesus encountered these individuals, he had a very simple message for them. Come. That, that's all he said. He didn't give a big long list of what he was going to do and how he was going to accomplish it and all of these different things. Of course, they had an idea because it was the Messiah. But his invitation for them to come and be a part of what he was doing was very simple. It wasn't, here, I need you to sign the fill out this form in triplicate. Sign this, I need you to register it with a, the registrar over there and have a note. No, it wasn't anything like that. He just said, come. Very simple. Very simple the way Jesus talked to his disciples as he walked up to them or they walked up to him and what are you doing? Where are you going? Where are you staying? Come with me. Come. They were called. David was called. Think about David. When David was out, um, you know, the calling of David is always interesting to me. Uh, Samuel shows up at, uh, at Jesse's house, and he says, God told me that there's going to be uh, the next king here, so go ahead and get your son, sons lined up, and they get them all lined up. I don't know, not him, not him, not him. They go down the line, and, and, and Samuel's like, is that it? And they're all scratching their head. Yeah, that's it. And then as an afterthought, they're like, oh, well, there is David. But David's the little scrawny guy out in the field taking care of the sheep. And they go get David. Sure enough, David is the one that God has ordained to be the next king. Samuel anoints him with oil. David was called. Samuel was called. What an amazing story behind Samuel. Samuel's sleeping there in the house of Eli in God's house. And, and he, hears, he hears an audible voice. Samuel, Samuel, yes, Eli, it wasn't me. Samuel, Samuel, yes, Eli, it wasn't me. Samuel, Samuel, yes, Eli. And Eli says, no, it wasn't me. That was God. Next time he says it, he says, here is your servant. Samuel, Samuel. There's little Samuel. Young boy, laying in bed. Here's his name again. Yes, Lord, here I am. Your servant is listening. Samuel was called. Isaiah was called. What a dramatic way that, say, that Isaiah was called. He has this vision, and God's glory fills the temple. And it's so full that it starts rolling down outside on the steps. It's just coming out of the temple. And here's all these chairs, cherubim flying all over the place. And, 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 and God says, who will go for me? What does Isaiah say? Send me. Send me. Samuel. David, Isaiah, the disciples that we just read about. Paul, oh my word, you want to talk about a dramatic calling of Paul. Here he is on his way to go persecute Christians. And all of a sudden he sees the blinding, flashing light. On his way to Damascus, he falls to his knees. And there Jesus is before him. Saul, so, who are you trying to persecute? He calls Paul. And we all know the story and the rest of what happened to Paul. 
We see how God used him in an amazing way. All of those disciples were called, or all of those individuals were called. What well, what did they have in common? What did they have in common? Well, here's what they had in common. They were ordinary men from various backgrounds with no, speci no, speci no specific specificity to their particular background. They all did different things. Some were teachers, or I mean some were uh, lawyers, some were fishermen. Uh, well, one of them was a teacher. They all had different things. Farmers, shepherds, they all come from different backgrounds. There wasn't one thing that linked them all together. They were ordinary men from various backgrounds with no special training, no regard to accomplish God's foreordained plan of, of restoring His plan of salvation. They were in the midst of living life. When Jesus was introduced, when God was introduced to them. Kind of interesting how that worked. Especially with the disciples. I love how the disciples, the, the, the whole story of the disciples is, if you understand Jewish culture, the thing you understand about the disciples and about every Jewish male was this. The cream of the crop of the Jewish males would at some point be attached to a rabbi. And somewhere down the road, that was their goal. The cream of the crop. If you were a Jew's Jew, you would somehow become un a, just a disciple or under the tutelage of a, of a rabbi. And for the rest of them, they just went about their regular business. and They did what their dads did. But for the cream of the crop, they got picked. When Jesus finds his disciples, did he find, uh, did he find the cream of the crop? No, he found the B team. And that's the most exciting thing about our faith. You don't have to be on the 18. Here's what I'm talking about. Maybe y'all, maybe y'all don't have the same recollection that I do. When I was when I was in middle, when I was in elementary school, I was a short fat kid. I never got picked first for anything except football. That's all. That's the only thing the short fat kid can do is he can play football. Put him on the line. Other than that, I didn't get picked. I didn't get picked first for basketball. I didn't get picked first certainly for running. I didn't get picked first for for anything that had to do with anything other than being a human wall. <laughs> if there was a sport for that, you were good. If you were the sport fat kid. I was always on the B team. I was the last kid to always pick. It would be like, and Kurt. <laughs> you know, they, you know you, uh, the captains are picking their teams, and finally it's, and Kurt. Here's the thing. These disciples, when they were found, they were the B team. They didn't get picked. Remember I said their goal was to be picked when you were younger to become like the rabbi? They'd been overlooked. They'd, they'd been already passed over. And here Jesus comes to them and says, come follow me. Of course they were excited. They were called. Here they are from different places, different backgrounds, no specific training, no, no, no purpose other than living life. And Jesus comes into their lives and they respond to it. Well, that, what was their response? They each followed, whether by much prodding, as with Paul. You know, he took a little bit, of, took a little bit more effort with Paul. Or without hesitation, as with Isaiah, when he said simply, send me, here I am. And in doing so, they surrendered themselves to the complete direction and guidance of God through His Holy Spirit. They went from being in, 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 in everyday nothing life to being in everyday nothing life with a Savior. That's what changed in their life. The only thing that changed from this day to the next day was the fact that they added Jesus to it. And it was their choice to do so. That's how they were called. That's what they had in common. And that was their response. And so the question that you might have is, well, if God called David, and God called Isaiah, and God called Samuel, and God called 12 disciples, and God called Paul, does he still call people? And I have an answer for that. Galatians chapter 1, verse 15, Paul writes to the church in Galatia, God in his grace chose me even before I was born and called me to serve him. What an amazing truth. God, through His grace, chose me before I was even born and called me to serve Him. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which He prepared in advance for us to do. Remember that toolbox analogy I gave you? God's got a job. And before we were even born, God had a job for us. God had a job for you, a very specific job for you. The fact of the matter is, just as all of these people of the Old Testament and the New Testament were called to give their lives to God's service, we too today are called to give God our life in service. Paul continues to write in Ephesians, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Does God still call people? 
This is the audience participation portion of the sermon. Does God still call people? Yes. Yes, yes He absolutely does call people. What is it? He goes on to say, in, uh, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, You have been chosen by God Himself. You are priests of a king. You are God's very own. All of this so that you may show to others how God called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Once you were less than nothing, now you are God's own. We were in the back praying, and a little girl walked in, with, and she had her little tiara on and her little princess outfit. And I thought, I thought, as soon as she walked in, I thought, how fitting. That's what we should wear when we come to church. I don't want a tiara. I'll, I'll, I'll take a regular crown. I don't want a tiara. But here's the deal. If God is king, so let me add this. This is more audience participation. Is God king? Yes. yes. If you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're, uh, you are immersed, you are obedient to Him, are you God's child? Yes. yes. What do you call the children of the King? Princess. Prince and princess. We are all princes and princesses of God, our King. That is what you've been called to. You've been called out of darkness into His wonderful life. Once you were nothing, now you are God's own and you are a child of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. In the Old Testament, people are called. New Testament, people are called. Today, you are called. We know what their response was. Very quickly, let's look at our response. Number one, step one. How do we, how do, how do we respond to this calling that God gives us? That can be in, found in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. These five steps. Number one, step one, dedicate your body. Paul writes to the church in Rome, I urge you to offer yourselves as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Our first and number one response to the fact that Jesus has, God has called us to his own is that we dedicate our bodies. God, here I am. Take me. Send me. God, you can have all of me. Here's the problem with that, though. We as, and I don't know if this is simply just an American thing or if this is just an old people as general thing, but we're very good here. Um, if y'all are any anything like uh, every other person I've met in this country. Y'all are really good, and I'm really good at compartmentalizing our lives. What that means is, here's the work part of me, and here's the church part of me, and here's the home part of me, and here's the recreation part of me, and here's the whatever else part of me. And the problem is, we compartmentalize, and that allows us to justify behavior. Because we can say, well, this is the part of me at work, and I've got to kind of be like this at work, or I'm just not going to fit in. But this part of you is completely different than the church part of you. I, I, I heard somebody say something to me one time, and I don't think I offended them, uh, because we're still friends. But they said something about, we were in church, and, uh, and they said, I heard them talking about something. I said, oh, you know, what was so funny? And they said, well, we can't tell you about it in church. I said, if you can't tell me about it in church, you can't tell me about it anywhere. Because this is just a building, right? We are the church. God wants purity not in this building. God wants purity in our lives. Amen? 24-7. Not just because we're in church on Sunday. We've got to be really good. No. God wants purity and holiness from your lives all the time. First, number, first step. Number one. Dedicate your body. I urge you to offer yourself. All of you. Step two. Eliminate competing distractions. Oh, this is so hard. Eliminate competing distractions. Verse 2 of that passage in Romans chapter 12 says this. Do not conform any longer to the what? Patterns of this world. But be transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. Don't be trapped into doing what you used to do. Rethink it the way God wants you to think it. Re-change your life. Change your life from the way things were to the way, things God, the way God wants you to be. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which means that we have to eliminate the things that compete for our time with God. Mm. And, and right now, everybody's sitting there going, are you going to stop preaching? Now he's meddling. Well, it's true. And it doesn't apply just to you. It applies, applies to me, too. I mean, there, I hate this. We talked about this driving up. I, I like watching some television shows, and there's been a couple television shows that I think probably... In my estimation, it probably been some of the best written TV shows ever in the history of television. 
and I can't watch them. And here's why I can't watch them. I started watching them, got hooked on them, and now I hate that I can't watch them, but here's the reason I can't watch them. They are so vile, or there's parts of it that are so ungodly that my even looking at it attaches me to ungodliness. And if I'm supposed to live my life in honor of God and God alone, then I have to get rid of those things. And so we had a conversation driving from the airport yesterday of these two television shows that I dearly love that I can't watch anymore. Why? Because as a Christian, I know that I shouldn't be even putting that stuff around me. It's like a sponge. If I soak up, and I think I shared this with you last time I was with you, we are like sponges. A, uh, if I put a sponge on a table and I pour water into that sponge, what happens to that water? It absorbs it. If I put more water on it, what happens? It absorbs it. It keeps absorbing it until eventually it gets saturated. And then when I pour water on it, what happens? Water comes out. Now, here's my question. Does the water come out of the top of the sponge or the water come out of the bottom of the sponge? It comes out of the bottom of the sponge. It's the pressure, the weight of the water going into the sponge that pushes the water out. Not off the top. It pushes it out. We are like sponges, and we soak in all of this stuff. What are you soaking in? Are you soaking in righteousness and purity? Are you soaking in garbage? Eventually, here's the thing. The more of God that you pour into your life, eventually it will push the rest of it out. Now the sad thing is, if you keep putting that junk in, it's going to push that out too. It's going to push God out too. Eliminate competing distractions in your life. Dedicate your body. Eliminate competing distractions. Number three, evaluate your strength. Romans chapter 12 verse 3 says, Don't cherish exaggerated ideas of yourself or your importance. Try to have a, love this, sane estimate of your capabilities by the light and the faith that God has given us. Estimate yourself. Evaluate yourself. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to, Paul says later on. He says, don't, don't cherish exaggerated ideas of yourself and your importance, but have the same estimate of your capabilities. I want to knock everybody down to the same playing level. Romans 3.23 3.23 says this, For what? All. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is what? Yeah. Death. Let's do a simple mathematic equation. Sin equals death. All people have sinned. All people deserve. Yeah. Here's your sane estimation of yourself. All of us are egg-sucking dog sinners in need of a Savior. All of us. The sane estimate says that I am nothing without Christ. The same estimate says I can accomplish whatever God needs me to do, but only through Christ. Evaluate your strengths and understand that you are in need of a Savior. Number four, cooperate with other believers. Verses four and five of that passage say, Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members don't all have the same functions, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all of the others. Every member, every member in God's body, Every member of this church, every member of, this, of, 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 of our team is, is a minister in God's body. Every member has a different function in that body. You might be a toenail, you might be a nose hair. Yeah, I don't know what you are, but you're all a part of the body. I'll pick those two. I like toenails and nose hairs. And here's why. They're insignificant, right? Nobody thinks about how important toenails are. Take one off and then drop something on your foot and see how important that toenail is. Nobody thinks of nose hairs. Oh, my word. Except maybe my wife. She thinks about them a lot because she's like, oh, trim your nose. So, uh, but nobody thinks of nose hairs in a, in, a, in a positive way. But take all them nose hairs out your nose and rake leaves some dry fall day. See how much you appreciate nose hairs. Whether you're a nose hair or a toenail, you have a place in God's body. And you are all part of one body. And every member's ministry is important. No member's ministry is any, important, any more important than anybody else. Whether that is ministering to somebody who's just lost a child. Whether that's filling communion cups. Whether that's sticking uh, cards in the back of the pew. Whether it's turning the electricity off. Whether it's making a meal for a family who, 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 who's in the midst of grieving. Whatever your ministry is, your ministry is important. And it is vital to God's body. And you need to be involved in that ministry. Does that make sense? God doesn't need your abilities. He needs your availability. What can I do for you, God? Number five, step five. What's our response? Dedicate your body. Eliminate competing distractions. Evaluate your strengths. Cooperate with other believers. 
Fifthly, activate your giftedness. Romans chapter six, uh, verses twelve, six, uh, verse twelve, verses six and eight says this: We have different gifts according to the grace God has given us: prophecy, serving, teaching, encouraging, contributing, leadership, showing mercy. All of those things are different, but they're all needed. All are different, but they're all necessary. All are needed. All are necessary. God needs you to activate what He has given you the ability to do. Now. Is the church called? Yes. Are we called? Yes. yes. We are called. God wants you to respond to that calling. He wants you to give yourself to Him. He wants you to be involved in His ministry. He wants complete total access to every area of your life so that He can make you what He wants you to be. As we spend the next uh, t- tonight and the next three nights together, we're going to look at what God expects from us. But the very first thing that you have to do is give God unfettered control to who you are. You have to give yourself to Him. It's as though God, Jesus is walking down the street, we notice Him, we walk up to Him, and we say, hey, man, where are you going? And He looks at us, each and every one of us, He looks at us and He says, come and I'll show you. It's our response that's the most important in this part. We can either choose to accept Christ, or we can say, no, I'm doing my own thing. One way, one way leads to heaven, the other leads to hell. The Bible, uh, Proverbs, tells us there is a way that seems, uh, seem, it seems good to a man, but in the end, leads to death. God wants us to give us who? He wants us to give us all of us. He wants us to give Him ourselves. That's the very first thing that we can do. Before we understand what God wants from us as we look at the rest of this revival, we understand one thing. God wants you first. This is from a, a reading from, I, I have a, a devotional that I read called uh, My Utmost for His Highest. And uh, this is the June 13th entry from uh, My Utmost for His Highest. It says this, Where our individual desire dies in, our sanctify, in the sanctified surrender lives. One of the greatest hindrances in coming to Jesus is the excuse of our own individual temperament. We make our temperament and our natural desires barriers to coming to Jesus. Yet the first thing we realize when we do come to Jesus is that he pays no attention whatsoever to our natural desires. We have the idea that we can dedicate our gifts to God. However, you cannot dedicate what is not yours. There is actually only one thing you can dedicate to God, and that is your right to yourself. If you will give God your right to yourself, he will make a holy experiment of you, and his experiments always succeed. The one true mark of a saint of God is the inner creativity that flows from being totally surrendered to Jesus Christ. In the life of a saint, there is an amazing, this, uh, this amazing well, which is a continual source of original life. The Spirit of God is a well of water springing up perpetually fresh. A saint realizes that it is God who engineers the circumstances. Consequently, there are no complaints, only unrestrained surrender to Jesus. Never try to make your experience a principle for others, but allow God to be as creative and original with others as He is with you. If you abandon everything to Jesus and come when He says come, then He will continue to say, come along, through you. You will go out into the world reproducing the echo of Christ's come. That is the result in every soul who has abandoned all to come to Jesus. The question is, have I come to Him? And if you haven't, Will you come now? One of my favorite hymns, and I found it in your all's hymnal. One of my favorite hymns is hymn number 277. Listen to these words. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. At the impulse of thy love, take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. All 
He says simply, come. What is your answer? There may be those, we're going to have a time of decision. I'm going to hand that over to Jake. But here, here's our decision time. If you have never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, and if you have never answered that call of come with here I am, take me, then today's the day to do that. Give your life to Christ. Be obedient to his word. Be immersed into, his, into, into salvation and into his family. If you've already made that decision, then I want you to consider this. Have you understood that you are called? And if you have understood that you're called, are you fully giving God access to everything in your life and allowing him to use you as, as he needs you to be used? If, if you've already made that decision to give your life to Christ and, and you're sitting there going, you know what, there are areas of my life that I need to change. There are areas of my life that are compartmentalized that I need to get 